The 14th century was one of the most violent, sickening and oppressive centuries in recorded history. Things came to a head in England in 1381 when thousands of peasants across the southeast said, we've had enough of being controlled by the lords and paying unfair taxes for pointless wars, we're gonna fight back. They organised themselves, grabbed their weapons, broke prisoners out of the jails and marched on London to burn the city to the ground and take their protest directly to King Richard II, a 14 year old who was expected to have the army answer to everything. But this story is about way more than angry peasants wielding pitchforks. In this video I'm going to tell you five shocking things about the greatest uprising in the history of medieval England. Make sure you keep watching until at least the third thing because you're not going to believe what the women in this revolt got away with. Welcome to the Radical History channel where we talk about the rebels, the revolutionaries and the real people who had skin in the game when it came to making history. Okay, here's the first thing that shocked me about the Peasants' Revolt. They weren't just peasants. The story I'd been told was that this revolt was about poor peasants from the countryside versus rich landowners and the monarchy. The truth is that field workers were joined by artisans, bakers, carpenters, traders of all types, the urban poor too, and even some knights and religious leaders. The reason for this diversity was that lots of people were annoyed about living under an economic system called serfdom, where you had to work for a local lord, giving away lots of the goods that you produced. You weren't allowed to go elsewhere to find another job and you needed the Lord's permission for basic decisions in your life, like getting married. Even though wages at the time should have been rising because of the shortage of workers after so many people had died in the Black Death, the government had passed laws limiting pay and the final nail in the coffin for the status quo was the government's new poll tax which applied to everyone in the land, regardless of wealth, to finance a war with France that had been going on for over 40 years. Thomas Baker, an actual baker, triggered the revolt in the village of Fobbing in Essex when he stood up for the villagers refusing to pay more taxes. Watt Tyler, an actual Tyler, later became the de facto leader. Even some rich lords sympathised with the peasants because they resented having to pay and collect taxes too. This wasn't a simple matter of poor people being envious of the rich. There were a wide range of people who saw the existing system of serfdom as being fundamentally unfair, government decisions as arbitrary and unaccountable, and who wanted more freedom and local control in their lives. Essentially, more democracy. Which brings me to the second thing that shocked me about the Peasants' Revolt. Listen to this. When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentle man? From the beginning all men by nature were created alike, and our bondage or servitude came in by the unjust oppression of naughty men. For if God would have any bond men from the beginning, he would have appointed who should be bond and who free. And therefore I exhort you to consider that now the time is come, appointed to us by God, in which ye may, if ye will, cast off the yoke of bondage and recover liberty. I mean, these words could easily have come from Thomas Jefferson or one of the American founding fathers 400 years later. But here we see the key principle of the inherent equality of all men and women being declared by the radical cleric John Ball. Ball had been effectively excommunicated from the mainstream church for his radical sermons. He was supposedly freed by Watt Tyler and the Kent rebels from prison in Maidstone. He then joined the march to London and delivered these rousing words to the crowd at Blackheath. If Watt Tyler was the leader of the revolt, John John Ball was its philosophical underpinning. What shocked me when I first read his words wasn't just that Ball was ahead of his time, but that they suggest that the rebels had coherent political aims and were looking for a fundamental change in the social system, rather than just being angry about having to pay some poll tax. One thing I found though was that the rebels weren't completely against King Richard. They believed the king's authority came from God, and they instead blamed the young king's advisers for the problems, and Ball actually declared that the rebels were with King Richard and the true commons of England. By the way, if you've learned anything from this video so far, I just want to point out that likes are free and I'd really appreciate you clicking the thumbs up button just below your screen. Thank you. All right, number three. Possibly the most violent participant in the revolt was actually a woman. And keep watching because you won't believe what her punishment was. While the king was in Mile End to negotiate with rebel leader Watt Tyler, a group led by a woman, Johanna Ferrer, attacked the Tower of London. Apparently, Ferrer personally dragged the Archbishop of Canterbury, Simon Sudbury, outside and beheaded him, blaming him for the poll tax. She then ordered the killing of Robert Hales, the treasurer, for good measure and had both heads stuck on poles and paraded through the streets of London. She wasn't finished yet though. Court documents say that Ferrer also burned down the 
Savoy Palace, home of the hated John of Gaunt, the king's uncle. Rebels destroyed priceless furnishings, metalwork and gems, but apparently didn't steal them because they declared that they were campaigners for truth and justice rather than thieves. The reason all this shocked me is because I suppose I'm more used to hearing about women as victims in history rather than about violent women who went on the rampage. We think now that contemporary accounts and even later historians downplayed women's involvement in the peasants' revolt, either because the country's leadership was embarrassed or because violent women like Johanna Ferrer just didn't fit their narrative of women as housewives and carers. Amazingly, although Ferrer was later charged in court, there's no evidence that she or the other women involved in the revolt were executed or punished like the male leaders. I was shocked to find out that she lived to fight another day. Shocking thing number four, teenage King Richard double-crossed the rebels. In the negotiation meeting at Mile End, Watt Tyler, the rebel leader, listed their demands, including an end to serfdom, the freedom to buy and sell all goods, and pardons for all the rebels. King Richard said, yeah, sure, anything you want, I'll do it. Would you believe a 14-year-old who immediately promised you everything that you wanted? Apparently most of the rebels did and they went home, but Watt Tyler himself wasn't so quick to trust him. He met the king again at Smithfield, demanding even more concessions, like the distribution of the church's wealth to the poor. At this second meeting, a scuffle broke out and Watt Tyler was killed by the king's guard. Legend has it that the king himself then calmly persuaded the rebels to go home, but later sent out small armies to pursue the rebels across the country and hunt down the leaders to be executed. John Ball, the priest who'd said that all men and women were equal in the eyes of God, was found in Coventry, and when he said that he was proud to testify his revolutionary faith, he was hanged, drawn and quartered. King Richard withdrew his order to end serfdom, declaring, You who seek equality with lords are not worthy to live. Serfs you were and serfs you are still. You will remain in bondage, not as before, but incomparably harsher. The lesson for me in all of this was probably don't trust teenage kings to always tell the truth. Although, let's not pretend that this revolt was a simple matter of good rebels versus double-crossing bad guys. As well as all the wanton violence and burning, some of the London rebels decided to randomly execute hundreds of Flemish immigrants just for being foreigners. Number five, even though most of the rebel leaders were killed and serfdom continued for the short term, the rebellion kind of worked. Parliament didn't try to impose another universal poll tax and they realized they might have to find a peaceful solution to the war with France rather than taking the English population for granted. Changes in the law allowed wages to increase, more people were then able to buy their freedom and serfdom was gradually eroded. The rebellion didn't work directly or immediately, but as far as we know, this was the first time that peasants and ordinary people had joined together to try to achieve political change, and it wasn't a complete failure. From that point on, England's rulers always knew that there was a limit to their power, a tipping point where ordinary people would eventually refuse to accept limits on their social and economic freedoms. One of the reasons that Britain has never had a full-blown revolution like the French or Americans is that the ruling classes gradually gave up power over time. I think they realized that if they didn't do that, then there was a risk their power would be taken from them by force. The Peasants' Revolt was a prominent event that was talked about centuries later and was a clear reminder of the risks for the country's rulers of overplaying their hand. Although I will say it has taken some time to move away from the laws and restrictions of the 14th century. Researching this video, I found that the death penalty for treason wasn't abolished in England until 1998. So there you go, five shocking things about the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. One, they weren't just peasants. Two, they had some democratic ideals. Three, women were involved and got away with horrendous violence. Four, King Richard completely double-crossed the rebels. Five, the revolt seemed like it failed at first, but may have actually restrained the power of monarchs for generations. Were you shocked? I was a bit. I mean, before researching this video, I kind of assumed that this was just poor men from the fields going on the rampage with pitchforks. And I hadn't realized that some of the principles of democracy had been declared as part of the revolt 500 years before these became the bedrock of modern constitutional government. But also how people were trying to win basic economic freedoms, like the ability to work for whoever you want, earn the going rate for your labour and buy and sell goods freely. If you enjoyed this video then let me suggest that you also check out the next video in our series about radicals with skin in the game, the people in history who put everything at risk. This is about the levellers of the English Civil War. Or alternatively, this video over here about the Mirtha Rising of 1831, exactly 450 years after the Peasants' Revolt, when ordinary workers in South Wales got together and rebelled against the British state. Thanks for watching and see you next time.